good old electronic arts. Everyone hates them. People hate them so much, they've quite literally been called the worst company in the world, beating all kinds of evil scumbags in the process. But they didn't gain such a reputation just because of bad games. Oh no, they gained it by buying up some of the best gaming studios the world has ever seen and then choking them to death, one way or another. Like an excitable child, EA just can't play with something without utterly breaking it in two. Just ask Peter Molyneux, he knows of all people. And so it's time to take a look at these corporate calamities, disastrous downsizes and brutal buyouts, as I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. 10 companies that EA bought, then destroyed. If you were playing games in the 6th generation, then chances are you've played and loved a pandemic game, even if you didn't know it. They're one of the studios where you play a game, think, hey, that's bloody good, and when you look up who made it, it just happens to be them. So while perhaps not as universally loved as some of the names on this list, they're still worthy of recognition. After forming in 1998 through two ex-Activision employees, Andrew Goldman and Josh Resnick, they went on to create some pretty awesome titles. Remember when Star Wars Battlefront was bloody good and not just a dull Battlefield clone with barely any features? Pandemic made the original two games. The much loved open world blow up everything em up Mercenaries Playground of Destruction was also one of theirs, as were the first two games in the Destroy All Humans franchise. Some of you might fondly remember Full Spectrum Warrior a tactical shooter which was marketed as being a title that was actually used by the US Army as part of their training. That was one of theirs too. In 2005, Pandemic merged with Bioware to create VG Holding Corp, potentially creating another player in the world of games. And it was at this point that EA started nosing around, ultimately buying the company in 2007 for the sum of $860 million, at the time a record for the company. Pandemic's next games, the sequel to Mercenaries and World War II French set stealth title, The Saboteur, were both decent, but didn't perform that well sales-wise. Sadly, despite all the money that EA paid, this was enough to kill them. In 2009, Pandemic was shut down. It's rather clear that, in the end, EA were only majorly interested in Bioware out of the deal, and Pandemic were just an extra. Pandemic's closure left a whole bunch of games cancelled, including more Mercenaries titles and a licensed game based on The Dark Knight. Although it did at least produce a video of a few employees from Pandemic's Brisbane studio smashing up a printer. Ultimately, EA gave Battlefront to DICE to see if they could do a better job than the studio they treated so badly. And we know how well that turned out, don't we? Pandemic were, of course, not the only studio to be acquired by EA and then closed quite sharpish after a long and decorated history. Westwood Studios are, indeed, a much more famous example. Like most of the studios on here, they have a list of great games as long as your arm. I mean, who could forget The Lion King, a classic and hard as nails Disney tie-in from 1994, or their version of Monopoly from 1995. It's games like this that have installed Westwood into the hearts of gamers forever. All that and the small manner of a series called Command & Conquer. From 1995 onwards, Command & Conquer basically took over the RTS market. No matter how it did it, it became the big name thanks to live action cutscenes, hell marches and action that most anyone could get to grips with. Command & Conquer in all its forms was a big deal as well as other Westwood titles, such as their brilliant Blade Runner tie-in in 1997, as well as various entries in the Doom series of games. In 1998, it was estimated that Westwood alone had a 5-6% share of the whole PC game market. This made EA step up and buy them from their parent company Virgin for $122 million. 
All went fine and dandy at first, with the successor Command and Conquer titles such as Tiberian Sun and Red Alert 2. But as soon as the series started to underperform, well, that was it. After the week's showing for games such as Renegade, EA closed Westwood up in 2003. They never got any kind of second chance. The employees were either laid off or consolidated into EA's Redwood and LA-based studios. Nowadays, the main founders of Westwood are largely not even part of the industry anymore. The Westwood closure is another example of EA's ruthlessness, and just another reason why everyone hates them. Still, Command & Conquer did blossom with new hands at the helm. I mean, sure the series did improve sales-wise and became ever more stagnant, but it did get Ric Flair in for Red Alert 3. So yeah, that that's good, isn't it? Woo! Woo! Yeah! EA's patented formula for success should be quite clear by now. It doesn't matter what sort of history a company has, you can still acquire them, tear them apart the moment they fail, and then do things in their name that amount to sacrilege. Want another example? Well, how about Origin Systems? This studio, founded in 1983 by Lord British himself, Richard Garriott, suffered a fate that even those who'd been burned by the company in the past would wince at. Now, I'd be here all day if I reeled off all of Origin's classic games, but it all starts, of course, with the Ultimate series from the third entry onwards, arguably the most influential series of PC RPGs ever in so many ways. First person antics? Ultima Underworld. Lots of moral choices? Ultima 7. Griefing poor innocents online and killing the founder of your series when he attempts to give a speech? Ultima Online. There's a lot here. When Chris Roberts came aboard in 1989, he also added the Wing Commander series to Origin's portfolio. That, and again, so many others. EA acquired Origin in 1992, and for the next few years, things went smoothly. Their two main series produced many a classic, and there are plenty of other games such as System Shock to go along with it. However, it only takes one game to ruin everything, and that game happened to be 1999's Ultima 9. There's no denying that said game was an expensive, delayed and unfinished disaster. I mean, it was so buggy that it was virtually unplayable on a lot of systems. Lord British himself would leave soon after, and EA announced that Origin would be an online-only company from that point on. And so, their last few years were spent taking care of Ultima Online, drawing up plans for a 10th Ultima that would never come, and barely existing before being closed in 2004. Now, you'd think that EA would do something with all the famous IPs they now had the sole control of, but no. Instead, the name of Origin is now used for EA's online store. You know, the one that everyone hates. So, quite, quite nasty. Something that would make even Treyguard wince, because in the eyes of EA, space shooters and fantasy RPGs just aren't big sellers. So you can see how they got so big now, can't you? Now I know what you're thinking, it's easy to say that, hey, Maxis are technically still going, but let's be honest here, it's really on life support. Some companies here got a quick bullet, but Maxis, well, they had a slow and painful death. It's almost as if the EA keep them alive for their own personal amusement, unwilling to let them finally slip away into a peaceful rest. It's a crying shame really when you look at all those games. So, so many Sims. The almighty Will Wright SimCity appeared in 1989, sold millions and was on every system going. It did pretty well really. There were even games that weren't SimCity, such as Sim Earth, Sim Ant and Rome Pathway to Power. And after being acquired by EA in 1997, Maxis did it again with The Sims in 2000, selling even more millions and saving their bacon. Will Wright's magic touch lasted for two games, but sadly, not for a third. 2008 Spore would prove to be his undoing, delayed to the point of being vaporware and somewhat lacking features on arrival. Spore wasn't a bad seller, but it was a big disappointment. Because of this, Will left the company, 
and Maxis has gradually been stripped of everything since then, losing its studios and employees. Still, EA did bring Maxis back as a brand, despite having taken its biggest games largely away from them. And how did that turn out? Why, there was a dreadful new SimCity game from 2013, the stagnant and dull The Sims 4, and assorted mobile spin-offs that are barely worth even mentioning. Maxis exists now as barely more than a name, a small corner in EA's Redwood mothership. So if it isn't dead, well it sure smells funny. Of course, the studios mentioned so far aren't the only ones who suffered at the hands of EA, so if I didn't include the following, I'd be hounded with endless you forgot comments. So here's a few honourable mentions. Visceral are the most recent victims of EA's Sword of Damocles, because studios that specialise in hot single player action are disgusting in their eyes. These guys, best known for the Dead Space series of games, were working on a Star Wars game headed up by Amy Hennig when the axe fell just before their closure. Said game will now be repurposed into, well, some service game bollocks filled with loot crates that no one will like and people will make angry videos about. Danger Close, formerly known as DreamWorks Interactive, fell victim to their big game series becoming stagnant. Everyone loved Medal of Honor in the late 90s and early 2000s, and rightly so. You could play as a Velociraptor in the original. But as time went on, it lost more ground to Call of Duty and various other titles, falling away as a result. They also took on Command & Conquer following the death of Westwood. But modernising Medal of Honor in an attempt to capture the Call of Duty magic didn't help. And ultimately the studio was gutted and turned into a subsidiary of DICE. Black Box Games were formed in 1998 by ex-employees from Radical and acquired by EA in 2000. You know them best for a whole bunch of Need for Speed titles and for the almighty Skate. While their Need for Speed titles weren't much liked, Skate was always good for a few pelvis shattering funny bales. But alas, EA got annoyed at one of their biggest franchises getting made fun of. They started to restructure Black Box in 2012, and then completed the restructuring by closing it in 2013. Mythic Entertainment were mostly known for MMORPGs, with popular ones such as Dark Age of Camelot in the early 2000s attracting EA's attention, who bought them in 2006. But alas, their next games weren't even able to put a dent in the then dominant World of Warcraft mothership, and they were finally killed off in 2014. And lastly, Phenomic specialised in real time strategy, with series such as Spellforce and a background that included the Settlers. EA acquired them in 2006, they released underwhelming games, and were closed down in 2013. But they do have the honour of producing the last officially released Command & Conquer game. Mind you, that series is almost like the kiss of death now, isn't it? Oh! <laughs> yeah, we had to put these guys at number one. I mean, after years of pithy one-liners and people wondering who that bald guy is I keep making fun of, I finally get a chance to talk about Peter Molyneux properly. And the story of Bullfrog is at least a little different from the other companies here, so it's worth putting at the top. Bullfrog formed in 1987 and became famous in 1989 following the release of Molyneux and Glenn Corpse's Populous, widely considered to be the first ever proper god sim. From there they went from strength to strength, releasing games like Powermonger, Syndicate, and Theme Park. They became one of the hottest computer game developers in the early 90s, and EA acquired them in 1995. Despite this however, they continued to grow stronger, with games like Magic Carpet and Syndicate Wars. Molyneux himself would become a vice president to EA even, however he didn't much like the corporate side of his work, and resigned from EA after finishing one of his greatest titles, the original Dungeon Keeper going on to form Lionhead. Bullfrog will make a couple more fine games such as Theme Hospital and Dungeon Keeper's sequel, but the loss of Molyneux proved to be their undoing.
Molyneux had a knack of keeping the corporate side of EA away from his company, which is something the other companies here didn't really have. Bullfrog would gradually change from a creative outlet into a typical EA studio, a process that Mark Healy compared to being assimilated by the Bork, and their creative teams gradually left. After a couple of lousy theme park sequels, Bullfrog ceased to exist in 2001. The studio space itself, later known as EA Brightlight, was used for a bunch of Harry Potter games before being closed for good in 2011. EA later said that they regretted what happened to Bullfrog and how they stifled their creativity through corporate meddling and restructuring. Not that they would actually learn anything from that. See, I can say nice things about Molyneux. Hello you. Thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified. And be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now.